Hello, I am William Elliott and this is Matthias Elliott. Together we have developed the fluid space drive. What is a fluid space drive? It is a working method for propelling spacecraft for enormous distance without expelling mass, what is called propellantless propulsion. It is relatively low tech. Anybody can build and test the fluid space drive at no great expense. It will permit the exploration of the solar system and beyond. It is a technology that permits us to begin sending probes to other solar systems. But first, I will try to explain why it's so important, such a big deal. We will talk about humanity's big problem. Why is it so hard to travel long distances in space? How and why propellantless propulsion solves the problem? We shall confront the fact that what is proposed is supposed to be impossible. We shall describe a simple loophole in the law of conservation of linear momentum. We shall mention present scientific consensus. We shall describe how it has been tested and how you can test it yourself. We shall briefly describe a few applications and, very important, we shall talk about brave souls. This is where we all live, you, me and everybody. Our planet may seem enormous and secure when we are comfortably sitting in front of a screen, but from a cosmic point of view, Earth is fragile and vulnerable. The fact is that we have all our eggs in one basket called Earth. That is why many believe that in the long run we must be a multi-planet species or risk being destroyed and forgotten, like ancient civilizations that were devastated by volcanoes on their one island civilization. We have options, we have the solar system and we have the nearby stars, but the distances are intimidating. Why is it so hard to travel long distances in space? We can travel to the moon in three days. We calculate a long 300 days to get to Mars. If we want to get to the moons of Jupiter, we are talking at least six years. Humanity has built and used many enormous and powerful rockets. Rockets burn fuel to generate push. When the rocket fuel is spent, the rocket cannot produce any more push. And the spacecraft has to coast at constant velocity for the rest of the voyage. In other words, the spacecraft receives a few minutes of push and then has to coast at a constant velocity to its destination for months or years. Here we have a typical spacecraft that is traveling with a velocity of 15 kilometers per second. Even though it is traveling at a very high speed, it will take months or years to arrive at its destination. This is because the spacecraft cannot increment its velocity without expelling mass. Its use is limited by the amount of mass it can carry to use as propellant. We need the ability to accelerate a spacecraft without expelling mass. In other words, we need propellantless propulsion. We need an engine with some ingenious mechanism that only requires a source of energy to push the engine forward for as long as we have an energy source. That would give the spaceship a constant acceleration as long as the energy source is functioning. If we send two identical spacecraft to Mars, spacecraft A with a fluid space drive attached and spacecraft B with no fluid space drive. They will both start the journey at the same velocity, but while spacecraft B 
We spent 300 days at constant velocity. Spacecraft A is constantly accelerating and will in time leave spacecraft B far behind and reach enormous velocities. You, the viewer, has been very patient, but are no doubt thinking, isn't this supposed to be impossible? Would this not break the law of conservation of linear momentum? Constant acceleration would be very nice, but at this time there is a scientific consensus that such a device is not possible. And yet, inventors and researchers have tried and failed to create a propellantless space drive for decades. But no mechanism, simple or complex, has demonstrated the ability to accelerate a closed system by any combination of moving masses from within. Hundreds of researchers and inventors have worked on propellantless propulsion, but not one has ever tried using a fluid in the method that we will describe. So how do we break the law of conservation of linear momentum? We don't. We just found a small loophole. This is how the fluid space drive works. First, the parts of the fluid space drive. First, we have the spaceship or payload we wish to propel. We attach a cylinder to the spaceship we wish to propel. The cylinder, or mass 1, is pressurized with air at normal atmospheric pressure. Inside the cylinder, we have two ramming pistons at the forward and rear end of the cylinder. Also inside the cylinder is a free-floating 100 kilo mass, we shall call mass 2, that has freedom of movement the length of the cylinder. The free-floating mass has a series of flaps that, depending on their position, open or closed, either offer minimum drag or, when closed, activate as an air brake. We also need an air-independent power source to generate electricity for all the systems. For the following presentation, we shall assume that the described elements have a combined mass of 800 kilos, not including the free-floating 100 kilo mass. The system has two principal cycles. Cycle 1, the free-floating mass, travels from the rear of the spacecraft to the forward end of the spacecraft. In cycle 2, the free-floating mass travels from the front of the spacecraft to the rear end of the spacecraft. We start with the free-floating mass at the inner rear end of the cylinder in position by the rear ramming piston. The piston expands with force, giving the free-floating mass a 1 meter per second acceleration in the plus x direction. As the momentum of a body is mass times velocity, the free-floating mass has a momentum of 100. The free-floating mass accelerated because the expanding piston gave it a strong force F1. As for every force, there is an equal and opposite counterforce, in this case F2, the piston and the spacecraft accelerate in the minus x direction. As the momentum of the spaceship and the free-floating mass is equal, we can easily calculate the velocity of the spaceship, which is 0.125 meters per second. We have the spaceship traveling in the minus x direction, the free-floating mass traveling in the plus x direction, both at different velocities, but they have different masses, and both have exactly the same momentum. The spacecraft and the free-floating mass continue to travel in opposite directions until they collide at the inner forward end of the spaceship. As both the spaceship and the free-floating mass 
have equal momentum, the system comes to a full stop. We start cycle two with a free floating mass positioned by the front end of the front ramming piston. Just like in cycle one, the forward piston expands, giving the free floating mass a one meter acceleration, this time in the minus x direction. Once again, we have the free floating mass traveling in one direction and the spacecraft traveling in the other direction with different velocity and mass but with the same momentum. The free floating mass starts with an initial velocity of one meter per second in the minus x direction. Then the flaps close forming an air brake that increments the drag force slowing the free floating mass velocity. Mass M2's initial velocity is one meter per second. As it travels towards the rear of the spacecraft, the air force drags slows M2's velocity. When it collides with the end of the spacecraft, it has a velocity of less than one meter per second. The spacecraft has been traveling in the plus x direction at a constant velocity of 0.125 meters per second. Its mass has not changed, therefore his momentum is exactly a hundred. As the free floating mass travels in the minus x direction, its velocity decreases. It is less than one meter per second. Therefore, its momentum is less than 100. When the free floating mass collides with the rear end of the spacecraft, as it has less momentum than the spacecraft, it does not exert enough force to completely stop the spacecraft. The spacecraft has gained a percentage of velocity in the plus x direction. Each time this cycle is repeated, the spacecraft will increase velocity in the plus x direction. Wait a minute, you may say. Are we stating that the free floating mass will lose velocity without interacting with the spacecraft? Yes, consider the following. You are now probably sitting in front of a monitor. You may perceive that the space between you and the monitor is empty. That is not the case. Between you and the monitor, there are billions and billions of fast moving particles that collide with each other and every collision they send each other in random directions. Let us look at how those air molecules behave inside our spacecraft. When the air brake is activated it is not an interaction with the spacecraft that slows down the free floating mass it is the collision, the interaction with air molecules. The air molecules that collide with the air brake, slowing it down, do not bounce in a straight line directly affecting the spacecraft, nor do they bump back and forth between each other like a cosmic Newton's cradle as they travel towards the minus x hull of the spacecraft, they collide with billions of molecules and their directions are randomized. No momentum is lost. Each collision transfers the same momentum to another molecule, but its vector is randomized. 
therefore no momentum is lost but the vector is randomized wait a minute you may say what about the scientific consensus that such a device is not possible remember that scientific consensus stated that heavier than air flight was impossible which is probably why the first flights were obtained by a pair of bicycle repairmen scientific consensus was also convinced that rockets would not work in space because they needed something better than a vacuum against which to react as the time stated in a 1920 article also stating that rocket pioneer Goddard really seemed to lack the knowledge that was taught in high schools. This caused many a scientist to state that space travel is for the birds. Nazi Germany was not influenced by the article and we all know how that went. Seeing is believing, you say. You are absolutely right. Fortunately, it is very easy to test the apparatus. If you wish to test the fluid space drive system or another propellant propulsion device, the best method we have found is a balanced mass system as illustrated. You put the device to test in a transparent airtight box and if a force is generated the test assembly will rotate around its rotational axis. The test assembly has to be rather large. A big room is required. It is not sufficient for the test assembly to gain some rotational velocity when the apparatus to be tested is turned on. A small change in velocity can be possible created just by the vibrations inside the box. In order to deduce the apparatus being tested is in effect creating useful force, the acceleration must be constant until air resistance or the twist in the cord or the string to the roof is tensed. You shall find it is not easy for an apparatus to pass this test. Fortunately, the fluid space drive passes with flying colors. For demonstrating the fluid space drive principle using the low friction tracks and cards that are available in a physics classroom, please see main page. Now let's talk about applications. Any project currently under development to take humans to Mars can be helped if the spaceship uses constant acceleration held by an array of fluid space drives instead of just coasting at a constant velocity. If we want to get to Mars fast using present off-the-shelf technology, we should consider using a Bigelow's capsule as spacecraft. The Bigelow's habitats have already been tested in space Therefore, all we need to get to Mars is a Bigelow habitat, which you already have, a landing craft, an array of fluid space drives with air-independent power supply, and some high tensile cables. So is it really that simple? Of course not. But we can think about it and work about it. If we replace the payload with a 2 gram nanocraft, we can get a constant acceleration of 0.2 meters per second. And if that is so, the nanocraft will reach Alpha Centauri in 28 years.
please see main page for details. Very interesting considering that using our present technology of rockets, we would reach Alpha Centauri in tens of thousands of years. Finally, I must talk about the brave souls without which none of this would be possible. The fluid space drive would be possible thanks to the persons that patiently listened while an apparently unwise idea was presented to them and then generously decided to contribute. There will all be early investors of a company that is being formalized on the 15th of March 2017. I ask you to consider joining the Brave Souls and contribute. You will become an early investor of something that is truly revolutionary. What will you get by contributing? For each two dollars, you will receive one share of the company that has been formalized. You will be an early investor. You will contribute to a practical method of exploring the solar system and beyond. You will participate and go down in history as the backer of an enormous scientific breakthrough. I am sharing this in good faith. I and others am 100% sure that the fluid space type works. However, as in most great innovations, there are risks. Please contribute, but however generous, do not invest more than you can afford. Thank you very much.